Hello and welcome to Biology Explained. Today we're going to be looking at inheritance as part of my A-level biology revision series. So what we need to know for inheritance, at least to begin with in A-level biology, is how we can produce and look at genetic diagrams to be able to show the possible genotypes and phenotypes of offspring. So if we think about it to begin with, humans are diploid organisms. That means we have two sets of chromosomes and so we have two possible alleles for each gene. Gametes, which are sex cells produced by you know, organisms, contain only one allele for each gene because they're, they're haploid cells. Then when gametes from two parents fuse together, the alleles they contain form the new genotype of the offspring. And at each locus, which is the position of an allele on a chromosome, the genotype can be homozygous or heterozygous, with homozygous meaning both alleles are the same and heterozygous meaning each of the alleles are different from each other. Now, these terms, homozygous, heterozygous, alleles, genotypes, phenotypes, are something you're going to have to make sure you just learn the name of and know exactly what they are so you don't get confused if they come up in an exam and you have to be able to explain what they are sometimes. So make sure you make sure to look up what they are and you understand what they are. And it will make learning all this kind of inheritance diagrams and what they are looking for here in the exam much easier. So I highly suggest you learn what they all mean if you don't know that already. So we can use genetic diagrams to predict the genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring produced if two parents are bred together or crossed, we would say. Now you need to know how to use these genetic diagrams to be able to predict the results of various crosses. And the first one we're gonna look at is what we'd call a monohybrid cross, kind of the pretty basic cross. So a monohybrid cross or monohybrid inheritance is where we're looking at inheritance of a characteristic controlled by a single gene. Monohybrid crosses show the likelihood of the different alleles of that gene, and so the different possible versions of that characteristic being inherited by offspring of certain parents. And so, for example, let's say that there could be multiple possible alleles for a specific gene, uh, for a specific characteristic. So we're going to look at something like freckles. And so there might be an allele for freckles and an allele against freckles. And so we need to work out what the likelihood of inheriting a specific combination of these alleles are, depending on what your parents' uh, genotypes are. And it will become clear as we talk through a, a brief uh, overview. So if we look at our parents, that's the, place, the, the important place to start. We see that one parent is homozygous, meaning they have two of the same alleles, and they're homozygous dominant, meaning that allele will take precedence over a recessive allele, meaning it's more like it will be shown in the phenotype, which is the outward expression of your genotype to the outside world. So you'd be able to see it if there was only one allele, which we will, we'll talk about later. And so one of the parents is homozygous dominant for freckles, and one of the parents is homozygous recessive for freckles. And so in this case, if you're homozygous dominant for freckles, you don't have the freckles. So freckles are a recessive trait, meaning you have to have both recessive alleles to gain freckles. So these are the two parents' uh, genotypes when they're going about, all their cells will have these two alleles in them because they have two chromosomes a matching pair of chromosomes basically. However, because they're diploid organisms, however, when they produce gametes, so egg cells or sperm, these cells are haploid, meaning they contain half the amount of chromosomes. So they're only gonna have one of, the, of each of their two alleles in each cell. So in this case, it doesn't really matter because they're homozygous. They're both homozygous, either dominant or recessive. So their gametes can only either contain, in, in the dominant case, dominant F and dominant F, or in the recessive case, dominant F, dominant F, as you can see on this diagram. So that's what a the parent's genotypes look like, but then it gets a bit more complicated when these gametes alleles, we can look at all the possible offspring that could be produced from these gamete alleles, basically. And so that, and that's what we'd call the F1 generation, so the first generation of offspring. So if we look at the F1 generation, we can see all the possible genotypes of the first generation of offspring. And in this case, if you've got a homozygous dominant crossed with a homozygous recessive, the only possible combination are all heterozygous. And that's important to 
to remember because there's certain patterns we can look out for. So in this case, it's all, all the children have to be heterozygous as one allele is inherited from each parent and as each parent is either homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. And the important thing to note is that each child has to contain, you know, one chromosome from one parent and another chromosome from another parent. So they can't both gain both dominant alleles from the father, let's say. So one allele comes from the father, one chromosome comes from the mother. And so you can only get combinations from those possible crosses. And in this case, it's heterozygous. So dominant, each, each child will have dominant, one dominant, one recessive allele. And then where it gets, starts to get a little bit more complicated than we have to be aware of is that all those children can produce gametes. But in this case, in, because they're heterozygous, each child produces one dominant allele and one recessive allele because, and that's just kind of, you know, almost random because when you produce the gamete, it's basically split in half. So the only two possible combinations you have is either the gamete has the dominant allele or the recessive allele in its haploid genotype. And then these gametes um, can then be, be crossed basically in, in produce the F2 genotype. So if we cross two heterozygous genotypes together, we get a broader range of a, a specific pattern forms for when you cross two heterozygous together. And that's what we call a three to one ratio in terms of the phenotype. So in terms of the genotype, you can see we get a dominant, homozygous dominant genotype. Then we get two heterozygous genotypes and we get one homozygous recessive genotype. And that always happens when we cross a heterozygous monohybrid cross together. So it's two pretty easy patterns. You can see if we're doing a monohybrid cross and we cross two homozygous um, parents together, homozygous recessive and homozygous dominant, we always get all heterozygous. So that's an easy pattern to see. And the other pattern that's simple to see is if we cross two heterozygous together and we get a you know one to one genotype ratio. But it's also important to know this is a three to one phenotypic ratio because a phenotypic ratio is the outward presentation of the uh, you know, gene effect to other people. So in this case, we'd have, because the dominant allele is for no freckles, we have three um, genotypes that contain dominant alleles. So therefore, we have a three to one ratio of uh, people having freckles. So only one, you know, 25% will have freckles because it has to be homozygous recessive in order for the person to show that they have these freckles, freckle genes. So that's important to know. You just gotta make sure you know that genotype is the combination of alleles and phenotype is how these combinations are expressed in the outside world. And so you just gotta make sure you can draw a kind of diagram like that. Sometimes it does come up and just show how you get from a homozygous parents all the way down to the F2 generation. And so it helps if you write along the left-hand side, you know, parents genotypes, gametes alleles, F1 generation, F2 alleles, sorry, F1 alleles, F2 um, genotypes. And then you also have the remember to write the phenotypes as well, and maybe the ratio. And so it's good to practice writing that out um, because I have seen it come up in an exam before. So hopefully that's clear. That's a, you know, pretty basic kind of crosses, but there's an easier way to draw it out. So that's kind of a, gets pretty complicated and messy. So an easier way to write it out is what we do is a Punit square, and that's what it's called. It's just another way of showing a kind of genetic diagram that we just went through, but it's much easier to understand and it's much more common for people to do. And they predict the genotype and phenotypes of offspring in the same way. So, what we'd, what we'd have to do for the first one is, you know, you have to work out the parents genotypes. So if we look at the F1 Punit square, we have the homozygous dominant parent and the homozygous recessive parent. And then they're always gonna produce two, two possible gamete alleles. But because they're both dominant, they can only produce, one of them can only produce two dominant gametes and the other one can only produce two recessive uh, gametes. And then, so what we do is we write them on this two by two square like so. And we basically, what we do is we cross the parents' gametes 
to show the possible genotypes of the F1 generation. So we'd go, we'd go across and this top row and we'd go across and combine the first one with the one above. So big F, little f. And we do that for all of it, essentially. So we just kind of combine the two we have on the outside with the box uh, to get the genotype. And so as you can see for this F1 generation, we get the same as we did in that more complicated diagram before, where we have all heterozygous for the F1 generation. And so it's a much cleaner way of showing that essentially, and you get the same result. And then it's the same thing if we do the F2 generation, because the F1 generation were all heterozygous, big F, little f, they can only produce big F or little f gametes, as I'm showing when I'm drawing this Punit square. So then when we combine all these possible combination of gametes from the either parent, we can see that we get a homozygous dominant, two heterozygous and a homozygous recessive, like we did in the F2 generation last time. And therefore we get a one to two to one genotype ratio or a three to one phenotypic ratio. And that's the same as we did last time, just a much easier way of drawing it out in much less space. So these come up, these will definitely come up to some extent in your A-level or in these kind of easy ones or more complicated ones that I'll get onto later. So it's important to you have an understanding. If you don't, leave a comment below and I'll be able to answer your questions. So there's two slightly more complicated things we have to look at for specific genes and how um, in monohybrid crosses it can get a bit more complicated essentially. So the first example we're going to look at is how some genes have codominant alleles. And so sometimes alleles can show codominance, meaning both alleles in the genotype are also expressed in the phenotype. There's no kind of recessive alleles like you would normally get, meaning that both of these alleles can kind of have be expressed and have kind of overlapping, you know, abilities with each other. So and a big good example is sickle cell anemia. So people for who are homozygous for normal hemoglobin, which is and, and the way you write it is, you know, you write they both both alleles have the same big letter and then you tell the difference between them with a little, you know, to the raised letter. So for this case, normal hemoglobin would be big H with a little n above it, and then kind of a diseased hemoglobin would be big H with an S for sickle cell. And so that's one example, although it could use a different kind of example that isn't sickle cell anemia. So if you don't have the disease, you'd have you'd be homozygous for normal hemoglobin as shown here. So that'd be you'd have two big H, big H little Ns in your genotype. If you were homozygous with sickle cell anemia, you'd have two big H little s's, which means all your blood cells are sickle cell shaped and can cause disease and can cause uh, major problems such as, uh, you know, strokes and things like that. But there are people who are heterozygous, so with one H to the N allele and one H to the S allele, so they're heterozygous. But because it's not like there's no recessive and dominant alleles like normal, it means there's kind of a combination of the two possible possibilities here. So they have what you call sickle cell trait, meaning they have some normal hemoglobin and some sickle cell, sickle cell hemoglobin. And so they're called codominant because they're both expressed in the phenotype, where normally you'd have one that was dominant and only expressed while the recessive one was kind of, you know, pushed out the way and wasn't expressed. But in this case, they're both expressed uh, to some level. And so as you can see here, you cross them like you would normally with a monohybrid diagram. Uh, you just got to make sure you draw them, you know, kind of correctly. But in this case, you don't have a three to one phenotypic ratio. You'd write it one to two to one for a phenotypic ratio because your heterozygous things, as they're not controlled by the dominant one. They're their own thing almost. So you've got to be aware of that. And then the other kind of example we have for a monohybrid cross is where some genes can have multiple alleles. So not everything has two alleles, which is most of the time when you look at it in an A-level biology thing, but some stuff can have multiple alleles. And so in the biggest example really for A-level is the ABO blood group system, where there's three alleles for blood types. 
And so again, you would write it like I with the raised to the power kind of A, B or O to show what type of blood group it is. And so I to the O is the allele for blood group O, I to the A is the allele for blood group A, and I to the B is the allele for blood group B. So this is where it gets a bit more complicated because allele I to the O is recessive, while alleles I to the A and I to the B are codominant. So that therefore people with genotype I to the A, IB will have blood group AB, while I to the O will always kind of be shoved out the way by AIA or IB. So as you can see on this genetic diagram, if you had a combination of one parent had a blood group alleles of IB, IO, meaning they had blood group of B because IO is recessive, so B is the dominant one, and group of IA, IO, meaning they had blood group A because A is dominant over O, the possible combinations you can get is type A and B because they're co-dominant, meaning they're both expressed, so you get AB expression, or type A because A is dominant over O, so you only get A expressed, type B because B is dominant over O, so B is expressed, or type O but because O is recessive, so because you've got two O alleles, O is the um, one that is expressed instead. Now, this one's a bit weird because you'd expect O to be rarer because it's a recessive thing, but O is actually really common in the UK because most people are descended from IO, IO. So it, it's, it's not actually as rare as you think, which is a weird example for this kind of thing. So you just gotta remember that codominant, um, you gotta think about how it affects the phenotype a bit differently to a normal allele because they're both expressed, meaning they'll have kind of a, a mixture of expression. And in the case of sickle cell anemia, you you get kind of a sickle cell trait where you've got a bit of sickle cell going on, but also normal cells. So it's kind of a combination. And then also multiple alleles where you get lots of kind of different combinations, but then you've also got to remember it gets more common because individual alleles there can be recessive or co-dominant or dominant. And so if any of that's unclear, please leave a comment. Hopefully you've liked the video. Please like and subscribe. Stay tuned for more. Thank you.